Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the inaugural Afternoon Sporties Quiz Hour. My name is Chris McGonigal, and I'll be your facilitator today as we try something new for our webinar series. For the next hour, our presenter John Zimmerman is going to test your aviation knowledge with 20 multiple choice questions covering everything from regulations to weather theory. Today's webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our Aviation Webinar YouTube channel, as are all of our Pilot Shop webinars. Also, all attendees who score a 20 out of 20 on today's quiz will be entered to win a $50 Sporties gift card. We will notify the winner tomorrow by email. So without further ado, John, take it away. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks everybody for joining us. Looking forward to, as Chris said, a little bit of a different format, something interactive. We hope that we maybe test your knowledge a little bit, but also give you some information and some facts. If nothing else, brush up on something maybe you'd forgotten. We're gonna to touch on a lot of different topics. Here. Uh, my name is John Zimmerman. As Chris said, I work here at Sporties with Chris. We're both pilots. We work there at the Claremont County Airport in Batavia, Ohio at Sporties. Uh, get to work with a lot of new products we deal with, but also just get to fly like you pilots who love being in the air. So we're gonna to touch on a little bit of everything, some weather, some regulations, some procedures. Uh, try to keep it pretty generic so that no matter what your experience level is, you can participate. I'll give you one shameless plug up here at the beginning. If you find yourself going through these questions, wanting to learn more, wanting to be better on a certain topic, uh, there's really nothing better than our pilot training platform. This is available online for your iPad, your iPhone, your Android device, even your smart TV like an Apple TV or a Roku. It has over 20 courses in there, basic private pilot training, instrument rating, avionics training, weather, Garmin avionics, uh, aerobatics with Patty Wagstaff, you name it, it's in there. So if you're interested in improving your aviation knowledge, this is your one stop for that. Uh, check out sporties.com slash discover to try it out online or go to your favorite app store and search for Sporties Pilot Training. You can download it for free and try it out. overview for you. Here's how it'll work. As Chris said, 20 multiple qu choice questions coming up. You'll answer those on your screen. I give you about 30 seconds to click on the right answer and then I will show the correct answer and most importantly then we'll discuss why it's the right answer and what we can learn from that. The point is not just to pass a quiz but hopefully learn something. So without further ado everybody let's dive right in. Question number one. Moist stable air flowing up slope can be expected to cause showers and thunderstorms, develop convective turbulence, or produce stratus cloud type. I will launch the question here and let you answer. All right, lots of answers coming in almost all of you have made your choice i'll give you just a couple more seconds if you haven't chosen one choose it now all right and we'll close it i'll share the results with you here fairly uh fairly scattered choices here we had uh number number one overall option coming in was the second one there was develop convective turbulence. Um, and that is, as we'll show you here, not the right answer. The correct answer was C, produce stratus type cloud, which 35% of you had. So good job to those 35%. Let's talk about why. Um, the key word there is stable. And uh, this is a topic that is overlooked, I think, a lot when we talk about weather is yes, the the, the mountain there is going to lift that air, and we know that lifting uh, air is typically a good way to create weather. But if it's stable air, it will have a tendency to sink back down or at least not rise anymore once it's been lifted. Yes, it's moist, so we'll probably get some clouds. We'll probably get those uh, that moist air flowing up the ridge line. It will probably condense at the, towards the top of the ridge there and you'll have a cloud, but it'll be stable. So you'll have smooth stratus clouds, maybe some showery precipitation, but you won't have that vertical development. You won't have the big billowing cumulonimbus clouds uh, and thunderstorms. 
And as I said, stability kind of overlooked, but you can tell an awful lot about the air mass you're flying in based on the stability of the air. How quickly does that parcel of air uh, that is cool, does it, does it continue to cool? Uh, does, it, does it rise, does it keep rising? You can tell a lot just by looking at clouds. You don't have to be a meteorologist for this. Look at the clouds and see if there are vertical development. Sometimes even on a summer day, you can see it rapidly, almost exploding out the top of a cloud. That's a, it's a, an area of weather where there's some instability and there's vertical development. And that's what leads to, some, leads to some of those thunderstorms and serious turbulence. So um, remember that yes, the lifting source is important, but think about whether it's stable or unstable especially as we get into spring and summertime and you're looking for thunderstorms. That is one of the key things you want to check out. All right, so there was your warm-up. Let's dive right into question number two, and this applies to basic med and about restrictions. Basic med has been really, really popular. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, created this driver's license medical standard for many private pilots. Uh, and we'll get into a couple of the details here. But there are some restrictions. So it's not quite as wide open as a typical third class medical. Which restriction applies to private pilots flying without a current medical under the guidance of basic med? You cannot fly on an IFR flight plan. You cannot fly an airplane with more than four seats, or you may not operate for hire. I will launch this question and take a minute and answer on screen. Lots of votes coming in on this one. Give you just a couple more seconds. Almost everybody has added their answer. All right, we'll close that up and I will share the results so you can see what your fellow pilots did. And most of you did quite well. So good job, 81% of you said you may not operate an airplane for hire. And that of course is the correct result. That is one of the key restrictions with basic med. It's actually, I think if you ask a lot of people five or six years ago, they expected more restrictions, particularly that IFR one. But uh, the main limitation is that you may not operate for hire. So here's a couple of reminders. Uh, the aircraft itself, maximum of five passengers, no more than six seats, max weight of 6,000 pounds. So that gets you into some pretty big capable airplanes. Do need to stay below 18,000 feet and there is that speed limitation. But almost all smaller piston general aviation airplanes qualify, which is really great news, I think, for a lot of pilots. You do need to visit your primary care physician or really any state licensed physician at least once every four years. So this is not an FA medical with an aviation medical examiner. It's just a doctor visit, which you really should do anyway. And you must complete an online training course every two years. That can be found at basicmedicalcourse.aopa.org. Um, and that's really the only things to do for compliance. The, the only other thing to add is that all of us should be certifying every time we go flying. Uh, it can be years between seeing doctors, even if you go to an aviation medical examiner and get a medical. Uh, it can be years between visits to the doctor. So you need to be certifying before every flight that for that particular flight, you are healthy and ready to make that flight. That's just good, safe flying habit no matter what. All right, good job everybody uh, on that one. Let's dive into number three. This one gets a little bit technical. This has to do with being pilot in command of an aircraft. When can you deviate from an air traffic control clearance? A, when the clearance conflicts with your filed flight plan route. B, in response to a traffic alert and collision avoidance system, resolution advisory or TCAS system, some RA sometimes called. Or three, if you are not in radar contact. And those are your possibilities. Let me launch the question here and answer on screen. All right, very good. Lots of votes coming in here, lots of answers, and you all are on the ball with this one. I'll give you just a couple more seconds. Get your final vote in, and we'll close it up. All right, so good job, everybody. 92% picked that middle answer. Uh, it, that is in response to a, a TCAS resolution advisory. 
Good job, because that is the correct answer. Uh, that is the correct answer. So you're on the ball on that. It, not that we want to get too much in the weeds here, but occasionally I see some confusion on this. It comes from Advisory Circular 120-55C and basically deals with if you get a TCAS resolution advisory. So it says climb, climb because of a traffic alert and your clearance from ATC is descend. Well, what do you do? Which one wins? And the AC is telling you that you should trust the TCAS alert and follow that and you are allowed to deviate. I will mention though that some people get tripped up. This is AC120 applies to air carriers, basically airlines uh, for the most part, you know, part 121 operators that have a TCAS2 system installed. If you have a portable Sentry or Stratus ADSB receiver, even if you have a panel mount Skywatch or Garmin traffic system, that does not count. That is almost certainly not a TCAS system that provides resolution advisories. That is a lower level uh, traffic uh, alert system or, or traffic awareness system. So that does not uh, count for this. More importantly, one thing I like to always remind pilots is your authority is pilot command per FAR 91.3, which is just a reminder of what your job is as a pilot. You are the pilot in command. You are directly responsible for and the final authority as to the safety of the flight and everything that happens. And part B there says, in an in-flight emergency requiring immediate action, you may deviate to meet the needs of that emergency. So this is not a blank check to do whatever you want and break any rule that you find inconvenient, but remember that under 91.3, you do have authority to deviate from a clearance if you need to do so in an emergency or for safety. So that is the true authority. That is a true job of the pilot in command. Don't ever forget that. Uh, whether or not you have TCAS on board, that is the case. All right, number four, some good light signals here. Control tower is using the light signal, the light gun, to direct a pilot to give way to other aircraft and continue circling in the air. So you've approached the tower, you don't have a radio, they pull out the light gun and they wanna let you know to give way and continue circling. What color will the light be? Flashing red, steady red, or alternating red and green? I'll put the options up here and you can answer. Some hesitation here. I can see the votes are a little more split. Most of us don't use those light gun signals in everyday flying, so you may be a little rusty on that. That's okay. Give me just a couple more seconds here. Get your choice selected and we'll close it up all right 50 percent of you said flashing red and uh coming in second place would be steady red so the answer is steady red so only 28 percent of you got that one that's your that's your winning answer there, uh, B. And here's just a quick reminder. Again, most of us don't look at this very often, so it's easy to get rusty here, but here are uh, the different options and whether you're in the air or on the ground, what it means. It's pretty obvious, you know, green is good, it means go, red means stop, but there's the steady versus flashing and then the flashing white. So there are some options. I highly recommend if you don't have this either printed out on an e-board or saved on your favorite iPad app. This is a great thing to do because you're not going to remember this in an emergency. So have it somewhere where it is easily accessible in flight. Uh, as I said, many kneeboards have it printed on them. Most electronic flight bag apps have this somewhere in their documents or PDF section you can find. So have it where you can get to it. Number five, let's talk about aerodynamics. Induced drag. Induced drag increases when airspeed is decreased increased or it is not affected by airspeed. Throw that up there and you can select your answer. Induced drag, does it, in, it increases when airspeed is decreased, increased or not affected? All right, couple more seconds. Get your votes in and we'll close it here. The winning answer here was increased. So uh, again, fairly split 
uh, fairly split here, but I will hide those and let you know that the correct answer was decreased, A. So 30% of you had that one selected, 58% had increased. This gets confusing when you start talking about drag and all the different options, but let's review real quickly. So induced drag is basically the price you pay for creating lift. So when, when you create lift on, over a wing, you're going to have some induced drag there. The other type of drag we often talk about is, uh, you know, friction drag or surface drag, the drag that is usually easier to visualize if you have a really rough surface as the air flows over it. That rough surface is going to create some drag, parasite drag, lots of different names people use for it. But induced drag is sort of that invisible drag, the drag that gets created uh, as a byproduct of lift. So as you create more lift, as angle of attack increases, you're going to have more induced drag. Of course, lots of things are done to try to minimize this. If you look at a jet's wing, this is a Citation 10, it's a good example. They do some things to try to keep that parasite drag low. It's a very smooth wing. You can see there are not a lot of rivets, not a lot of bumps on the wing. That's really the parasite side. For the induced drag, you'll notice the wing is longer and thinner. So sailplanes and gliders have those long, thin wings to reduce induced drag. Also have those winglets like you see here in the citation. Uh, that can reduce those wingtip vortices uh, and then and thereby reduce induced drag. So uh, you can't really directly see or control induced drag, but just something to remember as a part of uh, when you visualize what that wing is doing for you when you create lift, you are also creating some drag unavoidably. All right, number six, an important and somewhat overlooked topic, which is has to do uh, with scanning for traffic. Most effective way to scan for another airplane, you're flying along and you want to find another airplane that might be out there during daylight hours. What's the right way to do that? Should we concentrate at the three, nine, and 12 o'clock positions, those sort of cardinal positions? Short, regularly spaced eye movements at 10 degree sectors, or do you use your peripheral vision to scan? All right, lots of votes coming in and it's overwhelming. You guys are all over this one. Your primary flight instructor would be very happy with you. I'll go ahead and close it up. This may be a first one we have here today because 100% with the correct answer, those short, regularly spaced eye movements at 10 degree sectors. So uh, good to know that all of you out there remember this. It, I remember as a student pilot thinking this sounded a little counterintuitive, but once you do it and, and you recognize it, it really does work. You sort of freeze your eyes and let the airplane fly into your vision. Much easier to see it. Some pretty good reading if you ever care in the Aeronautical Information Manual, Chapter 8, Section 1. It talks about how the eyes can observe uh, and how they operate at night versus the daytime and what you can see. So I won't read that to you because you all got it correct, but Good reminder that keep your head up out of the cockpit, uh, stay, keep your head on the swivel, look for those other airplanes and use that short sector scanning method instead of just randomly going all over the sky looking for an airplane. And there's that AIM uh, chapter and verse for you. All right, we'll move on. Question seven, an airport with an EMAS is equipped. To do what? Do they report dangerous weather conditions automatically, provide radar services only as requested by pilots, prevent runway overruns using engineered concrete? Make your selection there and we'll share the answer. All right, a little bit slower votes coming in on this one. Maybe some hesitation, we'll see. A couple more seconds here, get your final vote in. All right, kind of a split decision on this one. Unlike the last one, uh, we've got number one choice is prevent and runway overruns, but somewhat close behind is uh, report dangerous weather. And a few of you chose the radar services one. So EMAS is an interesting topic, doesn't get covered a whole lot. But the correct answer there is C, prevent runway overruns using engineered concrete. If you've ever seen this, I think you might agree it's fascinating. Here's what it looks like on an airport chart. This is a Jeppesen airport diagram, um, but you can see on the left there, it says EMAS, it's at the end of a runway there, uh, and it's this sort of white box. And then on the right is what it is. It's 
it's much more sophisticated than this, but you can remember it basically as soft concrete, so that if you overrun the runway, instead of going off maybe down a hill uh, or into a busy street, the concrete will allow the airplane to sink into it and slow it down and prevent it from uh, making a, a more catastrophic problem. So it may not be a big deal for you. If you're flying a 172 or a Cherokee, you're probably not as worried about runway overruns as you might be in a jet. But the thing to remember is, if you see it in an airport, don't land there. Don't taxi on it. Don't get anywhere near it. This is, uh, I think, Charleston, West Virginia. They have one where it's a steep ravine off the end of the runway. And so to prevent a, a real catastrophic runway overrun, they have an ENAS there. Not going to impact you in your everyday flying, but for heaven's sake, don't ever land there or taxi there, or it will be a very, very short landing. Question eight, let's talk about pre-flight action in an area where there's a fair amount of confusion, I think. What is required for all flights away from the vicinity of the airport? An alternate course of action, should conditions change? A study of arrival procedures at airports you intend to use or the formal designation of an alternate airport not saying any of these are a bad idea necessarily but what does the FAA tell us we have to do for any flight away from the vicinity of an airport all right about to close this up, make your last selection if you haven't. The correct answer, at least according to you all, is that is uh, an alternate course of action if conditions change, followed very closely by the second option there, uh, study of arrival procedures. So the correct answer is that first one, an alternate course of action. Uh, again, not that there's anything wrong with the second or the third answer, uh, you're, you're free to do that, but to be specific, uh, FAR 91.103 deals with pre-flight action, and some people get tripped up on this because uh, in A there it says for flight under IFR, and so people will skip over it, but if you'll notice it continues for flight under IFR or a flight, not in the vicinity of an airport. Um, yeah, these are all the things they want you to check. Uh, you know, forecast, fuel requirements, alternatives, uh, runway lengths, performance numbers. But I think it's just a good reminder. We probably all do it, but you are both by good sense and by FAR required to have an alternate plan of action. This doesn't have to be a formal alternate airport like on an instrument flight plan, but you do have to have a plan for if things start to go awry, what am I going to do? Where's my out? Where's my good airport? Maybe it's turning around and coming back to my departure airport. One other thing uh, just to mention here, as it says here, you know, plan for an alternate, even if it's not required by the weather. You'll notice that there's no such thing as a legal weather briefing. And we sometimes get in this discussion about, you know, oh, well, did you get a legal weather briefing? Well, there really is no such thing. The FAA expects you to review all that material and wherever you get it from, you get it from. Um, and so sometimes I'll still hear people say, oh, well, you can't use, you know, four flight or Garmin pilot. That's not a legal briefing. That's really not true. Uh, there is no such thing as a weather a legal briefing, uh, but if you review that, if you use the you know, file tab in ForeFlight, for example, that's perfectly good. It's a pre-flight briefing. But spend some time developing your own pre-flight flow. Uh, there's so much information out there now, but it's not spoon-fed to us by an F FSS briefer. It's now up to us to get this information. So make sure you spend some time developing your own flow that covers all the important things, weather, notams, even nice to know things, pilot comments, FBOs, there's so much more than just the basics. Uh, the FAA has a, actually has a pretty good guide there. It's up there on screen. It's free online as a PDF. If you haven't read that before, it's probably worth browsing through. They have some good suggestions about how to get a better pre-flight briefing. Let's talk about some aircraft systems. What instrument will become inoperative if the pitot tube becomes clogged? All right, votes coming in quickly on this one. You guys are confident. And so far, you have reason to be confident. So I'm going to close this up in just a second and get your answer in if you haven't already. All right, big winner here, 90% of you said airspeed, 10% of you said altimeter, and of course you are correct. Airspeed is the right answer. If you have a clogged pitot tube, that will become inoperative. 
maybe obvious because we all think of the pitot tube as connected to the airspeed indicator, but just remember that the pitot static system, static port is plumbed into three different instruments, sometimes more. Uh, the pitot tube, really the airspeed indicator is measuring the difference between the ram air coming from the pitot tube and the static air passing the static port. That's really, in a sense, how it's working. So that may be obvious, but what people get confused on sometimes is, especially if they enter a cloud and the airspeed starts going down and you push the nose over and, ah, that's odd, we're at five degrees nose down and the airspeed is still decreasing. The airspeed's going down and you're in a cloud, your first re reaction should be pitot heat. Turn the pitot heat on, it's entirely possible your pitot heat, your pitot tube is icing up and restricting that flow and so your airspeed is going down on the indicator but not for real. So just remember that in a cloud, airspeed going down, turn that pitot heat on, it's free, it's not gonna hurt anything. Now there are other errors you can get into with a clogged or blocked static port, then you can get into situations with the altimeter or the vertical speed. But that airspeed is probably the most important dial on the panel for most pilots, so it pays to remember exactly how that system works. Question 10, we're about halfway home. You guys are doing great. Let's do another one on sort of systems and airplane management. This one has to do with the engine. What action can a pilot take to aid in cooling an engine that is overheating during climb. So it's a hot summer day and you're uh, you're climbing out and boy, that, that maybe that cylinder head temperature is really, really looking ugly and you're not real happy about that. What can you do? All right, lots of votes coming in. Another overwhelming one here. Looks like we're gonna have a clear winner. So I'll go ahead and close it up here. and show those results to you. And they're, as I said, they're pretty overwhelming. 95% of you say reduce rate of climb, increase airspeed. And that is the correct answer, of course. If our engines in most piston airplanes we fly are air-cooled, so in order to cool, they need airflow blowing in that intake over the cylinders, over those fins, and back out down the bottom of the engine. So airflow equals cooling. It's a hot summer day, you really wanna climb, but sometimes you have to sacrifice the climb and accept 300 feet a minute to get some more airflow. If you have cow flaps, that helps obviously as well, so open those cow flaps. The other thing you can do before flight or, or at your next annual is check those baffles. These get often overlooked, but there are baffles in that engine compartment that are really there to direct that airflow. Uh, as the air comes in the engine, it really needs to flow over those cylinders and be guided out the right direction. And those baffles can quickly get worn and pretty nasty, and they do not do nearly as good a job directing airflow if they are worn like that. So um, make sure you check those baffles. This, this is an easy, relatively inexpensive thing on your next annual. Ask your mechanic to check those out. It can make a big difference, especially in big bore engines. If you're flying a big IO540, IO550, something like that, where um, cylinder head temperature is really critical for long-term engine health. All right, I promise only one of these, but it wouldn't be an aviation quiz without one of these VFR visibility questions. So this one we're gonna talk about night in class E airspace. To operate at night, class E airspace, what do you need? Three miles visibility, clear clouds, one mile, and then the old 152 or 512, there are different people of different mnemonics, but 1,000 feet above, 500 feet below, 2,000 feet horizontal from clouds, or three miles in 152. Get your vote in there. And I'm gonna close it up, most everybody's voted. All right, pretty overwhelming there and you did well. The correct answer here is that third one that 69% of you chose, three miles, 1,000 feet above, 500 feet below, 2,000 feet horizontal. And that's sort of the familiar number, uh, that three miles visibility. I'll give you the uh, reminder here. Here it is straight from the AIM, about A, B, C, D, E. You know, it gets a little confusing with the whole over 10,000 feet, the class G at night and helicopters and all this. But if you remembered three miles visibility, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 horizontal, you're going to be pretty close. Uh, you can get away with less in B and G, but I'm not sure you want to. So. If the only thing you remembered about, v, uh, about VFR minimums was three miles, 512, 
uh, I think that'd be a pretty great place to start. If you've ever flown 500 feet below the clouds and three miles of visibility, you know it is possible, but it is pretty uncomfortable to be doing that VFR. So these are definitely minimums, uh, not suggestions to go out there and battle Mother Nature. All right, question 12, back to systems. A disconnected ground wire from a magneto to the ignition switch. This can happen. What, what happens? Will it cause no observable problem? It's just a pain, you need to get it fixed. B, could allow the engine to continue, continue to run after the ignition switch is turned off. Or C, will cause a fire in the engine compartment. Launch this and let you add your answer. All right, overwhelming. Yeah, once again, your flight instructors, everybody would be thrilled. Good job. 91% of you chose option B, could allow the engine to continue to run even after turning the ignition off. Um, I'm impressed because uh, I'm surprised how many people don't know this, or if they ever learned it, they've forgotten it. That is the correct answer. Um, it, it can happen, you get a broken lead um, and bad things happen. One of the reasons we teach at our flight school here at Sporties, and I think many others do, you can check this at shutdown, turn the key off momentarily with the engine running, just to check that everything is still working there, check that that key does work. Obviously, we like to turn the engine off by pulling the mixture at idle cutoff, but you can check to make sure everything is wired up the right way there, uh, make sure that ground wire is in place. It can break, it can uh, cause issues, and if you were to turn that ignition to off and the prop didn't stop, that would be a bad thing. So quick thing to check, easy thing to add to your everyday flow if you're not doing it already. Let's look at instruments. Let's look at that all important airspeed indicator. Which color identifies the power off stalling speed with wing flaps and landing gear in the landing configuration? Uh, this is a really important number for most of us because uh, if you're worried about avoiding that stall in the traffic pattern, this is the number you really need to know. We're set up for landing. Where can I find it? All right, lots of votes coming in. Pretty overwhelming on this one. Everybody's on their game. I'll close it up and share it here. 83% chose the first option, lower limit of the white arc. 13% option B. And that is correct, lower limit of the white arc. There's your cheat sheet there on the airspeed indicator. That's what all those markings mean. You should memorize those numbers for the airplane you fly most often, but if you're ever unsure, it is a great cheat that you can look at the instrument itself and find out exactly where it is. Obviously, if you fly a glass cockpit airplane, a lot of times these are bugged on the speed tape, although they usually still have some type of white arc there as well. So bottom of the white arc, Stalling speed and landing configuration. Bottom of the green arc is stalling speed, typically in takeoff configuration, although not always. That's a one that's overlooked a little bit because as we've learned more and more as we study stalls, many of them happen on departure or go around. So the classic base to final stall is actually maybe not as common as we thought. The one on departure or on a go around is maybe more common than we thought. Um, and so make sure you're aware of that other stalling speed, that clean stalling speed. All right, number 14, we're back to night flight. And you observe steady red and green lights ahead and at the same altitude. So lights aren't really moving. What, is, what can you infer about the direction of that other aircraft? Is it approaching you head on? Is it flying away from you? Or is it crossing? Choose your answer there on the screen. All right, we are just about everybody voted. So if you haven't given in, close it up. 75% shows the first option there. The other aircraft is approaching head on. 21% with flying away from you and 4% crossing to the left. So the majority is correct. Again, the aircraft is approaching you head on. 
And the way to remember this, A versus B, if the airplane was flying away from you, all you would see is that white tail light, that white rear position light. If it's steady red and green, if you can see both wingtips, that means it's headed at you. If you can only see one color, it probably means it's passing from one side. But if you can see both colors, that means that airplane is headed right at you. And if it's steady, it probably means it's at the same altitude and it's coming right at you. So steady, while it, in some ways it, it feels comforting, is actually the exact opposite. That is not what you want. You want to take decisive action in that case. All right, number 15. During a spin to the left, which wing or wings is or are stalled? Option A, only the left wing is stalled. Option B, neither wing is stalled. Or option C, both wings are stalled. All right, keep those votes coming in. We'll close it up here in a second. Pretty much a split decision here so far, so it'll be an interesting one here. All right, we'll close that up. So almost 50-50 here. I'll show you the results. About 50-50 between options A and C there, um, which is not surprising. This is This is a complicated subject. Most of us, again, don't practice spins all that much, if ever. Um, and so the correct answer is actually C, both wings are stalled. It makes intuitive sense that, that maybe the only the left wing would be stalled. That's why the airplane kind of rolls over and starts spinning that way. But in fact, both are stalled. Uh, it, you know, if you don't have, just remember, if you don't have a stall, you don't have a spin. So um, option B is clearly wrong. You have to stall the, the wing in order to spin it. And in a spin to the left, that left wing might be more stalled than the right one. So that sort of alludes to that, that incorrect answer, that option A, but they're both stalled. So just remember that. And of course, your recovery procedure, sometimes remember just pair, P-A-R-E, uh, three steps, really sometimes four. Reduce that power. You're probably gonna be going down to have a windscreen full of earth. So reduce the power. The A that, that is not shown on screen there is not, not essential in all airplanes, but not a bad idea. Aileron's neutral. Don't try to fly your way out of it with the ailerons. Fly your way out of it with the rudder, that number two on the screen there, opposite rudder to stop the spin. Once you've stopped the spin, you need to break the stall. So you need to decrease angle of attack. Some airplanes will essentially do this themselves, almost fly themselves out, but uh, it's not a bad idea to decisively make sure that the angle of attack is reduced and the wings are flying again. So you stop the spin, you've reduced the power, and you have recovered from the stall. Question 16, let's talk about ADSB, the most popular topic of the last year or so. Where is it not required? We talk a lot about where is it not required, but out of these three options, where is it not required? In class D airspace, in class E airspace above 10,000 feet, or above the ceiling of class B and C airspace up to 10,000 feet? Some of you may have very practical experience with this after the mandate in January 1st, 2020. All right, pretty good variety of answers here, but I'll give you a couple more seconds if you haven't chosen yours. All right, and we will close this up. Like I said, so pretty much a kind of a divided opinion here. A small majority picked A, Class D airspace, and 31% had option B, and 16% option C. So the correct answer is, of course, A. So good job, 52% of you. Class D airspace, you do not need it. It's controlled airspace, there's a tower, but many Class D airports do not actually have radar. If they do, they're just getting a feed from a nearby Class C or B airport. So you do not have to have ADS-B out there. Um, that may not be surprising, but, but B and C trips up some people that if you're going to go over the top of Class C or B airspace, you typically have to have ADS-B out, even though you're not in the actual airspace. Um, here's your, your good graphic. These have progressively gotten better over the years. This is the FAA's latest graphic and is uh, pretty easy to understand. There are some differences out over the Gulf of Mexico, for example. But this is another one you can save. Uh, it, it's available lots of places. Put it in your iPad, uh, again, as a resource if you ever forget, if you're ever unsure. Uh, if you're flying in busy airspace, airspace, you're flying in those Class B and C air, 
uh, airports where you're flying above 10,000 feet, you're flying a lot of IFR, you really need to have ADSB. If you're flying a cub off of a grass strip in the country, the good news is you probably don't need it. All right, a few more here. We'll wrap up, see who can go 20 for 20. Back to weather for question number 17. A warm front generally has the same slope as a cold front, a shallower slope than a cold front, or a steeper slope than a cold front. All right, just about everybody voted here. So if you haven't, make your final selection. All right, pretty clear winner on this one. 73% went with B, a shallower slope, 24% with a steeper slope, and 3% same slope. Well, the correct answer is with the majority, a shallower slope. So remember, warm fronts and, warm fronts and cold fronts really behave fairly differently. Typical warm front moves north or northeast. It has a generally a much shallower slope than a cold front, especially a fast moving cold front. They move slower, 10 to 15 knots, but they cover large areas. So whereas a cold front might kick up a narrow band of thunderstorms and severe weather, a warm front often means a huge area of stratus clouds and showery rain and IFR conditions. So if your instrument rated, they're not bad flying conditions typically, although there can be some ice there in the winter. Uh, but it's typically not as convective, uh, but it's widespread, and it's usually not good news for VFR pilots. But I think it's worth thinking about those slopes there, that, uh, you know, an airplane one mile above the surface, so 5,000 feet, you could cross the frontal zone maybe 300 miles beyond the surface position of the front if it's really shallow sloping. So if you see that surface analysis and it says there's a warm front over your departure airport, at altitude, you may be many, many miles before you even get close to that front at your altitude. So remember, think about the weather in three dimensions. Just the, the picture you see on that surface analysis does not represent necessarily the weather you're going to fly through at 5,000 feet or 10,000 feet. All right, question eight. Let's go to some ownership. Which operation here would be described as preventive maintenance? If you're a pilot, you're an aircraft owner, but you're not an A&P, you don't have a mechanic certificate, what can you do? It's sometimes confusing. So which of these options on screen can you do? Repair portions of skin sheets by making additional seams, replenish hydraulic fluid, or repair landing gear brace struts? All right, you are all over this one. Good job, either lucky guessers or really smart pilots here. 98% went with option B, which is replenishing hydraulic fluid. Tried to trip you up a little bit with that third one on landing gear because there are some landing gear things you can do um, as an owner, but that is not one of them. So option B is correct, replenishing hydraulic fluid. As a reminder, FAR 43, Appendix A lists this. This FAR 43 deals a lot with maintenance. Appendix A lists some of the things you can do as an owner as preventive maintenance. This is not the entire list, but these are some popular things. Uh, removal, installation, repair of landing gear tires. So you can change a tire. Um, you know, landing gear shock struts, you can, you can pump up a strut. You can replace landing lights. You can clean spark plugs. You can replace batteries. There's a lot you can do of sort of typical day-to-day -day things, actually. So if you're an owner, want to save a few dollars, check that out as a reminder of what you can do. Not a bad idea to get supervised the first time you do one of those things, though, uh, if you haven't done it before. All right, this is a long one, so I'll let you read it on screen here before I launch the question. Except when necessary for takeoff or landing, what is the minimum safe altitude for a pilot to operate an aircraft anywhere? A, an altitude allowing if power unit fails, an emergency landing without undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. B, an altitude of 500 feet above the highest obstacle within a horizontal radius of 1,000 feet. Or C, an altitude of 500 feet above the surface and no closer than 500 feet to any person, vessel, vehicle, or structure. I'll go ahead and launch that on screen. Some of those are slightly abbreviated. But what is the rule, except for takeoff and landing? How low can we fly? All 
All right. Almost everybody's voted, so get your last votes in if you haven't. And I'll share these results. All right. So a bit of a split decision here, right at 50%. Uh, went with the first option there, allow emergency landing without undue hazard. 21% with option B and 28% with option C. So this does get a little confusing. Um, a lot of us are familiar with that 500 feet above or 1,000 feet above, but really the answer we're looking for here is A. And this is sometimes overlooked because this is sort of the catch-all. There are rules for being 500 feet above certain areas, 1,000 feet above populated areas. Uh, those are out there, but sort of the general catch-all that is important to remember is that first one. And here it is, FAR 91119, minimum safe altitudes. Notice right there it says, A, the first thing, anywhere, an altitude allowing if a power unit fails in emergency to be made without hazard to persons or property on the surface. So um, that's sort of the FAA's catch-all. Uh, you know, if the, if the engine fails and it doesn't go well, uh, this is what they're going to probably get you with. But um, it's it's worth remembering that this is something you should always have the ability to do is plan for what if, what if the engine does quit? Uh, can I do something about that situation without uh, harm to people or property? Sometimes that property gets overlooked a little bit. It's not just people. Uh, if you've got to plow through a, a building to do it, um, it could be some issues. So I just bring this up, not to harp on it, but remember when you're buzzing a friend's house or doing that low flight over a scenic area. Uh, it, it's one thing if, yeah, it's an unpopulated area, so you think there aren't any restrictions, but you still need, do need to be safe, still do need to be thinking what if something goes wrong. All right, we're gonna close out one more question, this one on charts. Where can you find the correct frequency for pilot controlled lighting? You're going to a non-towered airport, it's after sunset, you know you're gonna to have to turn on some lights. Where can you find that information? Lots of places to find out which is the best source. A, sectional chart, B, aeronautical information manual, and C, chart supplement, or what we used to call the airport facility directory. Almost all the votes in here, so I'm gonna close it up. And share those with you here. Yep, 75% say the chart supplement, the old green book. 22% say sectional chart. Um, so you're correct, the 75% are right, it's the chart supplement. Uh, the sectional chart does provide information about pilot controlled lighting. It does provide information about runway length and frequencies and lots of stuff. So that is sort of true. The sectional chart is not a bad place to look, but uh, often overlooked because the you know, many of us don't carry the, the green books anymore and they're kind of hidden in some iPad apps is that chart supplement. That is still a wealth of useful information. So here's an, an example of a, you know, a sectional view of what you can find out. Yeah, you can see there's, you know, lighting, it's 5,000 feet long, the elevation, there's a frequency. But if you look at um, the airport facility directory or the chart supplement, you can see a lot more under that service area. And most of the time these days, the lights are controlled on the same frequency as the CTAF, the same frequency you're talking to other pilots. But there are still a couple of exceptions out there. And even when there aren't different frequencies, you'll sometimes see notes like the one you see on screen there about slow clicks. Uh, there is nothing worse than getting to your destination and clicking away on the mic and not seeing the airport lights come up. So if you're ever in that situation, check that chart supplement and read the notes. Maybe it's a different frequency, maybe there's a certain number of clicks you need to do, three, maybe it's five, maybe it's seven. That does vary depending on the lighting system. And broader point, don't forget about that airport facility directory or the chart supplement. It, it often gets tossed aside after you pass your private check ride, but there's some very good information in there, especially if you've never been to the airport before. I would definitely review that and make sure you know everything you need to know. All right, that's it. You've passed it, 20 questions. Thanks for joining us. I want to leave you with just a couple of places to go for more information. If this has piqued your interest and you want to learn more about weather or airspace or systems, whatever it might be, there's some great options. I mentioned there the Sporty's Pilot training app, available for iOS and Android. Check that out. It's free to download and try it out. We have a very active YouTube channel, webinar recordings like this one, video tip of the week, some great information there. 
We have a whole website called studentpilotnews.com. This is the free website with articles and quizzes and videos all about learning to fly and being a better pilot and developing your pilot skills. So I encourage you to check that out. There's a newsletter you can sign up for as well. And finally, check out sporties.com slash webinars. That's where all of our upcoming webinars will be listed. We have some great ones coming up for 2020. And you can also view recordings of previous webinars there. So thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks for your participation. Safe flying. And we hope to see you again on a Sporties webinar soon.